Thank you very much, Kylie. Thank you, Thermo, for inviting me to, to speak about natural dioxin formation. Thank you all in the audience for attending the meeting. In the next minute, we will talk about natural dioxin formation. And this is not really a new topic, but uh, I would say uh, for a long time, dioxin were just considered as an anthropogenic byproduct, as the uh, symbol of man-made environmental pollution. Uh, it was known that natural processes can still uh, lead to dioxins, but usually compared to industrial sources, we uh, have to face just very low concentration and the problem was very low compared to the industrial uh, processes. Uh, this changed a little bit in the 96 when in the United States um, uh, food contamination occurred and this contamination was caused by contaminated, heavily contaminated ball clay. And uh, these uh, samples were particularly because also beside the high concentration also a quite strange dioxin furan pattern was uh, found. And when you look, uh, have a closer look inside, then you see uh, that nearly no furans were present. And uh, on the other hand, you have very high levels of uh, dioxins, and uh, especially within the hexadioxins, uh, unusual ratio, uh, unusual high level of one to three, uh, seven, eight, nine hexadioxin can found in these uh, samples. So, um, Rappe and Ferrario did a lot of study on, on this stuff, and uh, uh, when it was found that these ball clay samples were at least 40 million years old, and they did not contain any other typical anthropogenic contaminants, uh, first was uh, proposed a so-called natural process that uh, was responsible for this formation and the pattern, this specific pattern was later also named natural formation pattern. Uh, however, the formation process of this natural formation uh, uh, pattern remained uh, unidentified. If we look uh, to the natural formation of dioxin, there are different ways you can have natural formation of dioxin. Uh, first of all, also, beside the bushfires, you can have also enzymatic reactions like uh, chloroperoxidase, and here I listed some of the uh, very interesting work in this field. And generally, also organochlorine, uh, organohalogen compounds can be formed by different uh, uh, ways, uh, you have a lot of biogenic formation ways that lead to uh, chlorinated compounds. Um, uh, for example, also a very new uh, work, uh, 2014, is from Munoz about the uh, formation from chlorphenols, pylenine, and manganese peroxidase. Uh, but usually, the dioxin concentration you get after this. Uh, natural biotic uh, reactions are quite low. Beside, uh, but natural dioxin formation does not mean only biotic formation. Of course, you can have the fire formation pathway. Uh, for example, bush fires, uh, also fire can form uh, dioxins. But you have also mineral surface catalyzed chlorination reactions. For example, a very interesting work is from Gu. Uh, when he mixed uh, chlorphenol with uh, iron montemorinite, a significant amount of octachlorodibenzodioxin was formed rapidly, within minutes. And Gu uh, did also another very interesting work about the clay-mediated route to natural formation of dioxins. And... Uh, um, uh, there are um, different work uh, they were able by um, um, related to the ball clay samples by uh, isotope ratio determination that was um, accurately possible to uh, determine the age. These are all uh, historical samples, so there is no uh, human influence on, on, on 
on, on, on the dioxins we found in the bulk clay sample that actually are the highest concentration uh, related to a so-called natural process. Uh, research is still ongoing. Um, we have a very interesting work um, uh, related to clay products used during pregnancy, especially in Africa. And also, beside bulk clay, in clay samples you can find uh, uh, dioxins. And uh, the author stated that the use of these uh, contaminated clays during pregnancy should be carefully considered or even discouraged. So, um, uh, this uh, natural uh, dioxin formation has an impact. And uh, also this year we have the nice work from uh, Broadwater and Franz Blau, uh, where they, they did analyze um, the dioxins uh, and PCBs during killing firing of bulk clay. It's known that bulk clay is used to make uh, ceramic vessels and uh, uh, they analyzed just uh, the dioxin concentration in the ball clay you can easily get in the United States uh, shops or stores. And the average uh, concentration found was 1,370 nanograms per kilo. So we still have uh, this product uh, in commerce with a relatively high uh, dioxin concentration. And uh, especially to the first work, I'm really happy that three of the speakers were involved in this work. We have here Heidi Fiedler, uh, Kotz and Trag. And so also within the, uh, th there is still an uh, interest on this uh, ball clay, on this clay uh, topic. But uh, what about uh, formation mechanism? Um, it remains still unidentified. We did some um, measurements on a hydrothermal carbonization plant in 2011 in Spain. And um, we found that after this carbonization reaction, we had a slightly increase of the dioxins, also the octadioxin slightly increased. And um, by discussing these results with uh, Joe Ferrario at the dioxin uh, conference, clearly also this discussion was catalyzed. Uh, Joe denoted me in one of the samples there was a strange ratio between the hexa um, dioxins and also that furans go down and dioxins go up. There could be some link between the hydrothermal carbonization and the ball clay topic. So, we have a look on the hydrothermal carbonization. It's just a thermochemical conversion process that is able to transform biomass within hour in a brown coal like a slurry. The process reflects the natural process of coal generation. Um, at temperature around 200 degrees and pressures about 20 bars, uh, biomass uh, will be dehydrated and transformed in a bio coal. Uh, with a heating value similar to of, of that of brown coal. So uh, the um, hydrothermal carbonization is uh, a simple process. It's like a pressure cooker, but uh, don't do uh, this um, carbonization experiment in a pressure cooker because the reaction starts at temperature around 200 degrees and 20 bars. That's too much for a pressure cooker. But uh, the process is not new. It was described first by Friedrich Bergius in the last century, and he got the Nobel Prize together with Karl Bosch for this uh, um, contribution to um, chemical high pressure methods. So um, we tried to um, do this hydrothermal carbonization at a different experimental carbonization, and we applied it to sewage sludge samples and we try to resample a clay matrix by simply mixing aluminum oxide, silica gel, fly ash as a dioxin source and uh, green, course, green cut hay as a, a carbon uh, matrix and of course water. We put that all in a, a steel vessel and we heat it up to different uh, temperatures. So more detail you will find in the uh, paper uh, published last year in Chemosphere. 
So, what doesn't happen? Um, if we go up with the temperature, we see that the chlor chlorination reaction starts. Uh, here we have the typical uh, dioxin pattern, that's a total ion current chromatogram. We see here octadioxin, octafluran, then the heptas, hexas, penta, and tetra. And after applying the hydrothermal reaction, we uh, denote the dechlorination uh, at higher temperature, temperature octa dioxin and heptadioxins goes down, and we see this increase of uh, penta and tetra dioxins. But uh, beside this, if you have a look to, the, for example, to the hexas, we see also the nearly complete elimination of furans. Here we have the classical uh, hexafuran pattern we find, find in fly ash, and here that's just noise that's left in the chromatogram. Uh, this is the native, below we have the labeled, uh, you see the chromatogram of the labeled standard. But uh, regarding the dioxin, we see that um, a rise of the so-called 1469 pattern, that's also very typical for the ball clays. So by um, lateral dechlorination, we uh, obtain this congeners, and we see this, uh, the, the predominant congeners after hydrothermal carbonization are these 1469 um, substituted, like in ball clay. And we see also within the toxic hexadioxin the rise of the 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9 hexadioxin that's becoming dominant. Uh, to resume a little bit uh, what we did, we did uh, HTC experiment also at lower temperature, but now I want to show you all what, 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 what to show you what happens at higher temperature. So if we have a look to the fly ash, so we have a starting toxicity about 250 toxic uh, equ um, picogram toxic equivalent equivalents per gram. Then after um, a hydrothermal carbonization at 255 degrees, we have a, sli a slightly decrease in the toxicity. If we go up with the temperature, we have again an increase and at a temperature higher than 310 degrees we have a nearly we have a completely destruction of all dioxin um, this uh, shape is um, uh, produced by the uh, dechlorination dechlorination goes on at 275 degrees we have nearly only tetra and pentadioxins within and also within uh, this uh, tetra and pentadioxins that are the most uh, toxic, we, we have this increase in the toxicity. If you go further up, then uh, the dechlorination goes on and practically no tetra, penta, hexa, heta, octa dioxins are present in the sample. If you look to the sewage slots, then it's a little bit different. If we have a starting toxicity about four picogram uh, per gram, after carbonization at 255, we have more than 100. So we here assist the increase, a 25 fold increase in the toxicity. And at high temperature, the toxicity goes down. And again, at higher temperature, we have nearly a complete destruction of all dioxins. Um, but um, this experimented experiments related to um, real samples, to uh, sewage sluts one side, or to clay matrix with fly ash in. So we did also HDC experiments by using just poor octachlorinated dioxin, just to be sure that, the uh, that just a dechlorination process must be responsible for uh, this uh, change in the dioxin pattern and of uh, we see again uh, that um, only uh, also only octadioxin is uh, sufficient to get uh, hexa chlorinated dioxin we, we, we find also that the, the same uh, uh, pattern also uh, we found in uh, fly ash after uh, applying uh, carbonization um, hydrothermal carbonization to octa dioxin uh, in clay matrix green cut and water but uh, we want also i want to show you also what happened when we 
to just hydrothermal reaction. This is actually not hydrothermal carbonization, but it's just octadioxin with clay matrix, but no green cut. And uh, here I have the same relative intensity. You see that still you can have some dechlorination, but compared uh, to that, what you will find when you have also the green cut, the carbon source in, that's just really a small amount of that will of um, dechlorination will happen. So, uh, conclusions. Um, the dioxin furan uh, present in the environment will undergo a natural transformation process. And by, this, by the coal formation process, by the carbonization, um, we have predominant uh, lateral uh, position dechlorination, but also a peri dechlorination happens, that means the toxicity can increase naturally um, if uh, uh, dioxin uh, are left in the environment. It's just a matter of time and condition when and how it can happen. Um, especially octadioxin can be transformed in uh, by this natural geological process in much more toxic chlorinated tetra uh, 2378 substituted uh, dioxins and also pentas and uh, i think one input is that we should uh, be uh, aware that if you put something in the environment, it doesn't remain there as is it. And in the case of the dioxin, we can see that uh, by a natural process, we can uh, create a problem in our future. And this is maybe not also related only to dioxin. Now, beside the POPs, uh, we have another emerging emerging uh, class of compounds like the polar, uh, the persistent polar pollutants, the so-called P3 substances, for example, uh, fluorinated compounds, or also uh, diclofenac, who is a pharmaceutical compound. Uh, these uh, compounds are also persistent, and maybe now we should also uh, take in account what can happen with these substances if they are left in the environment. And this can be also extended to the persistent plastics or envir our environment is full of plastic and also what will happen to these persistent plastics. Um, Yesterday I saw in the very interesting speak of uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fürst that uh, fortunately dioxin levels in the environment goes down, but they go down because uh, we were able to recognize what, what's going on by also by doing analysis. We were uh, able to quantify this compound in the environment and then we can do uh, measures, we can improve the cleaning technology, we can improve emissions and that at the end helped to reduce uh, this concentration in the environment because I'm convinced otherwise we would not assist to a decline but to the increase and these um, environmental contaminations, they uh, <coughs> repeat in history, for example, uh, also at the time of um, ancient Romans, uh, for example, they used uh, lead for vessels for uh, every day's uh, things. Uh, uh, lead uh, was for the Romans like uh, plastic is for us now. And uh, they also realized very lately that maybe there is a problem when you use lead uh, to concentrate uh, unfermented fruit juice uh, to sweeten wine. And uh, so um, I would also like to uh, Thank you, Thermo, that it's now uh, the driving power in the field of instrumental techniques and give us uh, new tools. Then I think you will need new tools also to be uh, more conscious about what are the effects what we are producing uh, now. And um, regarding the natural formation, I have here also a list of a very interesting publication. Abad who is here, and of course, uh, Joe Ferrario, he did uh, very good work in this field. And I think we have also to mention Caroline Gauss and Yuichi Hori. 
And uh, before I will end the speaker, I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Monika Hoen, who is present here in the audience and helped me to start in the dioxin uh, analysis field 15 years ago. Thank you very much for your attention.